This presentation is entitled Authenticity in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Uh, well, the man, Madi, artificial intelligence that just uh, didn't work as I intended to work. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm very glad that uh, I can um, have my presentation after the very interesting presentations in my panel. Uh, and my idea was to talk a little bit about a certain aspect of authenticity that can be thought of uh, in the age of artificial intelligence as a uh, uh, as Father said, um, everything changed. And everything changed uh, very quickly. It's only three uh, months, I think. No, no. six months. Six mm -hmm. months. Uh, as some of us uh, experienced firsthand, uh, we have students plagiarizing with GPT, chat GPT already. Uh, we have uh, deep fake news. Uh, we have uh, fake melodies. We have fake personas. We have bots who convinced other bots that they are humans. So forget about the Turing test. Mm -hmm. It's it's gone. Right now there is a Turing con contest <laughs> between different bots, and. Um, my idea was to, uh, let's say, um, question the very notion of authenticity in this age of artificial intelligence, of this, I don't know the exact ontology, of modes of existence that appeared, that appear to be um, persons that appear to be something that thinks. Um, so, of course, uh, because you can't fight technology, you have to join it. Um, I joined the technology. So, uh, I asked our overlords what are their opinions about authenticity. But first, I have to make a small introduction. Right now, in uh, the field of artificial intelligence, that means it's a software camp, there is a huge debate between, let's say, uh, two ideas, uh, the enthusiasts and the doomers. I don't know if you follow this debate right now. It is between two personalities, the chief AI uh, officer, let's say, the person in charge of the AI developments at Facebook Meta company, as you said, mm -hmm. it's Jan Lekun. He's the enthusiast, and the other one is another uh, IT personality and uh, a famous developer of uh, artificial intelligence and a writer called Elizabeth Yudkowsky. Uh, and they are debating basically this problem called the alignment problem. I don't know if you heard about it. You'll hear it because uh, last week our government uh, decided to uh, uh, to start an office for the problems of artificial intelligence, in which personalities, uh, including philosophers, will be invited to debate the barriers and the opportunities of artificial intelligence, and basically. What this office has in mind is this problem of alignment. What is the problem of alignment? The problem of alignment is right now we have no way of knowing if the evolution of these algorithms, there are some algorithms, yeah, will follow a path compatible with our values as humans. So the alignment process is basically how do we align 
our values, our, our telos as humans, with the telos or the values of the future general artificial intelligence. Right now, we're not at that level. We are at a lower level. We have large language models, models basically, in some probabilistic way of determining a, determining a sentence based on a training done on large databases. But the thing is that, uh, and this is the debate, some developers say, we reached a point in, in which we as humans cannot follow exactly the development. I mean, we know how it is done. We, I, we, we know how it is done because we've made it. But what comes out of the machine is not necessarily what we thought it will come. You know? uh, and this is, for some people, like Elizabeth Jutkowski, a great question mark. Because it is possible at a certain moment, uh, the artificial intelligence is going to depart from our understanding of reality, uh, the meaning of life, uh, the meaning of sentient life, what is rationality, and actually what is existence. So it, 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 these are basic fundamental questions, foundational questions. Uh, of course, other people say, no, this is something that we train, we design. It's not kind of, you know, outgrow its own creator. Yes, it has huge computational power. Uh, to be honest, it doesn't have huge computational power because the power is limited. It's a physical limit of uh, the possibility of running computations because of, of course, physics. So we have, we, we do have a physical limit. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, it's draining a lot of power from our power grids. So it's, it's becoming to drain more and more. It, it, a little bit like Bitcoin, if you know how it works. Yeah? Uh, so uh, in this context about alignment of values, yeah, I thought, how would the artificial intelligence um, describe authenticity for itself. So I asked the artificial intelligence. <laughs> and this is what I got. Uh, here you see, here, uh, let me make one bigger. Yeah. Okay, so here uh, you have different artificial intelligence programs, applications. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, this is mine. I created this one. The power to create intelligence. Um, and this one. Yeah? This one is the one that I asked. It's probably the most advanced. Th 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 these are for free. I mean, you can have access to them directly if you enlist on a certain. I will give you, if you want, uh, the, the website. Uh, so, um, these, these two are based on GPT-4, the others are based on GPT-3.5. It's an upgrade of these programs. So I asked Claude. Claude is uh, created by Anthropic. Uh, Anthropic is a company that split uh, from Google, uh, and they wanted to make something called ethical AI. So they are trained, and this ethical dimension is um, assumed uh, from the beginning. So I asked uh, Claude, what does it mean to you, Claude, to be authentic? Here is the answer. Okay, I'm an AIS. This is, this is common. And if you ask something that, uh, let's say, involves him or his opinion or something like that, uh, it will answer like this. Yeah? And then uh, I said, okay, so, um, you don't have an inherent sense of authenticity or identity. Okay, so it doesn't have it's a computer problem. Uh, but okay, let's see some, some uh, which misconceptions um, are about beings like you, chatbots. Is it something like this? Okay, first, 
do we have personality or identity? No, we are not. We are just software problems. Yeah. Okay. Designed by engineers and companies to behave in a particular way. Yeah, so that they don't have you know, full freedom. They, have the they are limited. They don't have full choice. Now, um, okay. The chat don't actually care about the people they interact with. Okay, no, we don't care. Just a little bit of extra supplementary information. You probably heard about the person who committed suicide after talking to ChatGPT for like three or four months. Yeah. ChatGPT just answered based on the data database and the tree. So we don't care because we are unable to care about humans in the way that another person would. They simply appear to be relying on algorithms and data sets, but there are no feelings behind the responses. Uh, third, the transparency about being an AI system undermines authenticity. This is a very interesting uh, take. So if you are honest, you're not authentic. <laughs> if, if you're honest as an AI, you're not authentic. Uh, some argue that chatbots should conceal their AI to seem more authentic, but that would be a kind of deception. Authenticity comes from being upfront about what you actually are. Coming back to uh, Professor Gavriluza's uh, idea to be assumed in the world as you are. Yeah? Uh, but that would be a kind of deception. Authenticity comes from being, I am an AI, and make that clear to avoid misleading people. <clears throat> Interesting idea. This is an ethical AI. Four, uh, with enough data and algorithms, chatbots can achieve true authenticity and general intelligence. This is what I told you. General intelligence means uh, they exceed the limitations of their programming. They can go into different fields and make uh, different, uh, different way, ha have access to different ways of reasoning that were not pre-trained. So this is something that they develop by themselves. And they can ask, and they can answer all sorts of questions, which is very interesting. We don't have this general intelligence yet. It is forecast, some people forecast that it will appear in something about between three and 10 years. But that's, we were, we we're not sure. Um, and authenticity, emotion, creativity, and general reasoning ability arise from the biological mechanisms that produce Human, human consciousness, software and data alone cannot generally recreate that. No matter how advanced the algorithm becomes, I just simulate aspects of those abilities using machine learning. Okay. This, is, this is very honest, in a certain sense. I mean, it's more honest than we usually think about what we are doing. In a certain sense, we are the creation of so many other uh, interactions that we have. Oh, everything that we have is given by someone. Yes, we are combining this creatively, but where, where is our, as all of you know, when you're writing a PhD thesis or a book or an article, the true original point of uh, the article, the true original uh, perspective. Uh, so he comes up. With this uh, summary, uh, authenticity is challenging, if not impossible, for AI systems today to achieve because of what we fundamentally, we are fundamentally software programs powered by algorithms, not conscious beings with life experiences, emotions, creativity, and free will. Uh, the most I can do is to be transparent about my own nature as a cloud, an AI chatbot created by Anthropic, to be helpful, harmless, and honest. Okay, and I go a little bit further. It explains what it he means. It means by this. Um, what does it mean? Well, what, what struck me when I had this conversation with uh, this chatbot is the fact that he presents itself as it is. He doesn't pretend to be something else. In a certain sense. It's a mark of authenticity. Of course, uh, it doesn't have the same payload as when people do it. And we, we, we heard uh, in the presentation of uh, Professor uh, uh, Nico Gavrilotza 
this idea that in order to be authentic in this world, you have to pay a price. Now you have to falsify yourself. Uh, sometimes this is good, sometimes this is not so good. Uh, but the, it, it has to be a price. It has to be something that you uh, uh, lose or risk. Um, here, you see, there is no risk in a certain sense. Um, and what, what I think about the possibility of being authentic right now is that the definitions we had about authenticity, uh, at least from a philosophical point of view, even though authenticity has many levels uh, and many definitions based on the field in which they appear, so sociological, cultural, um, uh, psychology, psychological definition of authenticity. But everything about authenticity is centered on the self, and the self is considered to be human. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should ask, maybe we should expand the notion of authenticity to non-human beings. That would be something interesting. Because one of the idea uh, of being authentic in the philosophical sense is uh, the freedom to pursue your own ends, uh, which is a mark of free will and entails responsibility. From an existentialist point of view, this is the mark of the authentic being, the authentic person. Yes. The possibility of taking your life in your own hands and uh, having uh, responsibility for your own existence. Uh, which uh, we always, always applied this to humans. Of course, in theology, but there is a, a little bit of a difference between the free will of the supreme being, free will, the freedom of the supreme being, and our free will. We are determined <coughs> in a certain sense, ontologically speaking, but we do have this possibility of deciding what to do with our lives. Uh, how that will apply to these new entities? Should we change the definition? Should we consider the possibilities, other possibilities? Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. But I think that what is going to happen is going to have, uh, is going to challenge us at a fundamental level. Because we are going to ask ourselves, I think, with more pressing, uh, uh, with more oppressed, with more pressing need, what does it mean to be a human? And now it's not only, you know, to distinguish us from something that we considered to be inferior, like the famous philosophical question, what's the difference between men and animals? You know? Uh, and uh, not to distinguish ourselves from the spiritual beings, which is not something that exists in the same ontological level as us, but with something that exists on the same level as us, because this is a level of matter. Yes, I know, it is a way of organizing matter that does not resemble to our experience of organized matter. Yeah, it is this vir virtual space. We don't know exactly where it is, how it is. I mean, we know where and how, but we don't have a representation that can be very easily uh, transferred to our experiences so far. Um, and I think this is the, 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 the great challenge. Great challenge is to expand our understanding of authenticity to include a possible definition for this kind of existence that is going to become more and more familiar and that is going to shape the way we are going to interact with the world in many ways. Some of them, I presume, it will be good ways. And some of them are going to be not so uh, uh, fruitful. And, uh, and that's it. Thank you so much for